Welcome to Health, Wellbeing and Lifestyle, where experts in the field inform, educate and inspire their community to be healthier, more balanced and live the lifestyle they love. Our first guest today, Anthony Kilner, is a psychic medium and author, and the topic we'll be discussing is spiritual insights and healing through psychics and mediums. Welcome, Anthony. Thanks for having me, Megan. It's lovely to be here. So, Anthony, what's the difference between a psychic and a medium? Uh, a psychic does one thing, a medium does another. They can cross over those boundaries. In mediumship, a medium is there to connect with our departed loved ones from the spirit world. And there's a lot of healing that takes place on a heart level during that connection. Whereas a psychic will use more tools, so tarot cards, divining rods, crystals, those sorts of things, to help someone understand where they're at right now and moving forward. So they're, they're two very different sort of modalities, yet the crossovers are quite often very minimal. So you can have a psychic medium, uh, you can have a straight medium, or you can have someone that calls themselves a straight psychic. What a medium's doing is a medium's there to, like I said, create healing between the person still here alive and the person that's crossed over. And they will share those messages. And if you're looking to go to a medium, you want the medium to give you as much accurate information because it's all about proof of survival, life after death, whichever way you would like to look at it. Psychic will use their body and the energy of their body to connect to the person's body and give them an understanding of what's going on. And that's where you start getting a lot more information. Now, to highlight that point, I brought in two, two tools that we can use. One is tarot cards. And this is the Rider Waite deck. So it's a very old deck, one of the very first decks of tarot. And we can do a whole segment just on tarot. But how would you like to shuffle those for me? Sure. And then the other thing I brought in is a set of divining rods because divining rods are quite often used for not only for finding water and other bits and pieces, they're used by people to get yes and no answers like a pendulum with a crystal on it, same sort of thing. And so to give you an idea of how this works, I always make sure my hands are locked and I'll ask the question, so open for yes and they just open up. Then I can go cross over for no and they'll cross over for no. But then I can say, okay, where's Megan? And point to Megan. <laughs> now you can see that's happening without my hands moving and that's the, that's the important part. And so you can get yes, no answers. I use them to measure energy and all sorts of different things. And so that's what you're looking for is how they react. So one of the things when we talk about uh, how the binding rods work is my energy comes through here. It doesn't touch the divining rod at all and then it flows out and goes up here and up to the spirit world and this is where I see the universe or spirit actually using it. Now, I can see the energy at the end of this, so I can put my hand up here and grab that energy and just move it, move it, move it like that around and then I can go back the other way and it's stretching on me, there you go, and it's going the other way. And so we're talking energy and the energy of our body in the universe is what helps us understand how things can work and then how we can get our answers for that. Now, you've been shuffling those cards for me. Now, I won't say anything personal or private, but just drag along a card, which one feels right to you. So let's see what you've drawn, Megan. The King of Cups. The King of Cups. Wow, what an interesting card to draw. So the King of Cups, you're in your strength, you're emotionally there. Cups represent emotions as, as one of the main things and your emotions are contained. You're surveying all that is around you and working out, okay, am I in the good space? Not so good space. However, what that tells me is there's some confusion around your emotional state at the moment and that that's okay, you're on top of it. Okay, so it's a very, very brief reading and we're not getting too personal. When it comes to healing, I've heard there's different approaches between psychics and mediums. There is, and there's a school of thought out there that says a medium and a psychic can't be a good healer for different reasons. And I don't subscribe to that because I believe that all of that energy, it comes from intent and from the heart space, best healing ever. So if we wanted to break it down a little bit though, a medium, can use healing guides, connect up that on that level and use universal energy to affect good healing. 
or energy work as I like to call it. And a psychic can utilize things like crystals and sound and vibration, again, more tools and their energy to do it. I believe the energy that's supplied by both happens automatically. So some of the modalities like Reiki, where you're using symbology and, and hands over the body, as different to some healing that is sound related or hands-on healing, they're all sort of quite different in the modalities, but the energy is still coming from Mother Earth, it's still coming from the universe, and then our intent is to bring about or facilitate good, balanced, energetic healing so it gets the body to heal itself. What advice can you offer our audience if they'd like to book a psychic or a medium or learn about them? My suggestion is word of mouth is really good. All right? So talk to people. Ask them if they've seen someone they would recommend. You know, there's lots of ways you can look on the internet now and do all sorts of in research that way. However, going with somebody that you trust that tells you that that person was good, that's the way to go. When it comes to things to look for is you ring up the medium or the psychic, ask what they're going to give you. What are they going to do? How are they going to do it? And, you know, lots of people have rung me up in the year, oh, how good are you? And I think, well, that's so subjective because I'm only as good as my next reading. All right. So don't ask that question. Find out how long have you been doing it? How are you going to work? What can I expect? Can I bring a photo of my loved one? those sorts of things. And also have a list of questions that you might want answered. Because even though, for example, a reading might just be mediumship for the whole time, there could be little snippets of psychic stuff that comes into the middle of it. And so you never know what you're going to quite get. But they're the things that I would be suggesting are really strong points to look at, to book a reading or even an energy session, a healing session. To me, whether you're learning or getting a reading, it's got to work practically. It's got to make sense to you. If, if your teacher or the person you get to give you a reading, if they're not making sense, it's not going to work. And, and all the same rules apply to a, finding a teacher, to sit circle, to learn. Question the teacher. Ask how long they've been teaching. What do they teach? How do they teach it? And all those questions are really, really important to ask. And then find out if they'll let you go and sit in their group for a couple of weeks to try it and see how it fits for you. Thanks, Anthony. That's such rich information. If you'd like to know more about Anthony Kilner and spiritual insights and healing through psychics and mediums, please go to his webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. And after the break, we have another interesting guest with another interesting topic. Stay tuned. After the break, we have international meditation teacher and coach, Daniela Damore, talking about personal evolution and conscious creating. Welcome back. We have international meditation teacher and coach Daniela Demore here to discuss the topic of personal evolution and conscious creation. Welcome, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. Daniela, personal evolution and conscious creation, what does it really mean? Well, it's a big topic, really, and it's very popular at the moment, you know, with uh, especially after the movie The Secret and various things like that, Laws of Attraction. But really, what it means is in my belief, of course, uh, what it means is our own personal journey of evolution, you know, being the spiritual uh, beings, having this human experience, and how through using the creative, the universal creative energy to create into our lives, what we're doing is learning about our own power, our personal power. And the more and more we learn about our personal power, then the more we are evolving as these spiritual beings, right? Yeah, so it seems like a very complex, very deep topic, and it kind of is, but really at its core, the simplicity of this beautiful topic is just to remember that we are creators. We are creators, like if the creator created universes, created this world, created us, therefore in the likeness of, of it, therefore we're creators, right? So when we're creating, 
we are honoring that universal energy, whatever that is for you, whether you call it God or Buddha or whatever you want to call it. Whereas when we're not allowing ourselves to create through uh, fears, various fears and doubts and insecurities, then we're really not honoring the creator and therefore not honoring ourselves. So the more and more we can honor that in ourselves and take that power back, it's not selfish to do that. I think a lot of people think, oh, but I'm being selfish if I do that. No, you're, you're not being selfish because to love yourself and to honor yourself, then you are, you know your power, you know who you are. And I think what happens then is we become kinder and more compassionate people. Daniela, how could we apply this in our everyday life? Well, you already do. You already do, whether you're conscious of it or not. And that's why I say conscious creating is about becoming conscious of what you do. And that, again, is about taking that personal power back and saying, oh, I'm creating this because I'm angry today or I'm upset today or I'm happy today. You know, we create all the time. Everything you have in your life right now, every single thing, you created it. Now, most of the things that we have in our life right now are good things are really positive things, right? But we tend to focus on the things that are lacking or we don't have, right? So we think life's hard. And when we understand that we have the power to create things in our life, we stop blaming people. We stop pointing the finger. Well, I'm like this because of my parents, the government, you know, whoever, right? We, we stop doing that because we're owning our power. So it is, it comes down to basically self-responsibility. And when we're responsible for all of the thoughts and actions that we take, that makes us powerful. Makes us powerful. And we're powerful because we know who we are. We know what we want. We know what we like and what we don't like. And I guarantee, despite the more than 8 billion people on the planet, we all have different likes and dislikes. Not everybody wants the same thing. And even if they are, even if they do want something similar, it's not going to be exactly the same. The, the beauty of that is you put your personal stamp on that. You're going to create it your way and that's the beauty and the world obviously needs it. So it does come down to self-belief, but we have a self-belief when we know that we are part of this immense, enormous, creative universe. And again, whatever you prefer to call it, and that we are born of that and we have that within us and we have that magic, we have that power to create what we need to create. And the more and more we know that, the more and more we live that, the more and more we align with that, then the more we are evolving as beings. For the viewers at home, where's a good place to start? Good place to start is to check in with themselves. So whenever anything is happening, good or bad again, just stop and check in with yourself and just say, how am I feeling right now? Because even when we're creating good stuff, you wanna check in and, and ask yourself, how am I feeling right now? Because you want more of that, don't you? You wanna feel that more and more. What, how am I feeling? What am I thinking? What are the sensations going on? How is my body feeling? What's showing up in my life right now, right? Good, I want more of that. And the same when it's not going as positive as you'd like it to go or there's situations, circumstances in your life that you'd like to change, stop. Just stop. Take a deep breath, check in with yourself and say, how am I feeling? What, what is happening within me? And let it come out and you'll probably find that there's always some kind of fear, some doubt, insecurity that's there. And that turns into, you know, fear. Nothing good comes from that really. Right. So if we can come from a place where we're loving the moment, a lot of good is going to come from that. So the more and more we can stop and ask ourselves, how am I feeling right now? Like what's going on within me and be totally honest, then the sooner we're going to get through whatever it is we're going through and get to the other side where we can start creating, you know, much more positive um, results or situations in our life. But not only that, we'll also look better, I think. We won't look so stressed and tired and frustrated, you know, and it just makes us happier people, right? Because the more and more we're in a calm place, the happier we are. And so again, we're going to make better decisions for ourselves. And from making those decisions, then we take action and we take positive action, which is going to result in positive, um, you know, results, basically. 
So whereas if we make decisions from a fear standpoint, which under the heading of fear is lots of, you know, different uncomfortable situations, um, then if we make decisions from there and take actions from there, then the result cannot be uh, positive. You cannot have a positive result from a not positive journey. <laughs> you know what I mean? A negative journey will not provide a positive result. So it's along the way and we're always going to have that little setback. You know, you might be going along going, yes, 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 and punch in the air and going, I've got it, I've got it. And then something will happen. Someone will say something to you, something will happen. And immediately we go straight into that autopilot, into that default. Oh, I'm not good enough or I'm scared or you're not feeling safe or whatever it is that triggers you. But becoming conscious about that, you know how to move through that faster. You're not going to sit in it, not going to stay in it uh, as, as long as you probably would and blame someone else. Daniela, that's such valuable information. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. If you'd like to know more about Daniela and personal evolution and conscious creation, please go to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeinginglifestyle.com.au. And after the break, we'll have another interesting guest with another interesting topic. Stay tuned. After the break, naturopath, lecturer and author Michelle Wolfe will be talking about the importance of the nervous system to the digestive system's health. Welcome back. Our next guest is Michelle Wolfe and she's a naturopath, author and lecturer. And the topic we'll be discussing today is the importance of the nervous system and the digestive system's health. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Megan. Michelle, what's the difference between the two? Well, the mind and the nervous system have a big uh, connection. So I'm sure you've experienced the feeling of butterflies when you've been frightened about something. But scientifically, they've now find that not only do we have a brain-gut connection, but also that the gut has its own brain or own nervous system, so to speak. So for an example, it, it produces serotonin, which is a chemical produced in the brain that helps the nervous system and helps calm the brain. Um, so our lifestyles can have a profound effect on the nervous system, and that has an interaction with the gut emotions, they can actually affect the, the microbiome. So in microbiome tests, which are stool tests, they test over 700 different species now. And there can be an impact on that microbiome through your diet, but there can also be an impact on how you think. So if you're stressed or have um, an overburden of more negative thoughts, that has uh, an impact on the negative aspects of the, the microbiome. And also that kind of stress has an impact on your upper digestion. So you won't produce as much uh, pancreatic enzymes from your pancreas or as much hydrochloric acid from your, your stomach and the liver's implicated in that as well. So if you're um, frightened or holding on, it can kind of shrink those uh, digestive chemicals and it can also have an effect on, on constipation if you're holding on. Whereas uh, completely different to that, you can have diarrhea if you're very anxious about something. Um, and that can follow the butterfly feeling in the gut. And in your diet, a lot of people have coffee. But if you have a delicate nervous system, when you have a coffee, it will likely make you more anxious and it will either give you uh, diarrhea or pain in the gut or inflame uh, the gut. The other thing that coffee does is it, it's a diuretic, which means it makes you pee more. And then that has an effect at moving out magnesium, potassium, and calcium. And those are major min minerals for your nervous system. So you'll likely become more anxious or more stressed from those uh, coming out. There are also lots of other foods that have an effect on the nervous system and then on the digestion. So any kind of uh, junk food or sugar will make the body more anxious and more depleted and then have an effect on wiping out your good flora and fauna in the gut um, and having a negative effect on that. But if you have whole food, um, so for example, whole grains, um, legumes, good proteins, lots and lots of plant foods, then you'll get the nutrients for 
your nervous system. So the main ones being the magnesium, the calcium, the potassium, um, B vitamins are very important as well. Uh, and then the gut will have less uh, effect. Also, if you have long-term worry or you have a very responsible position and you've got things going over and over in your mind a lot, you can develop inflammatory bowel disease. You can also develop inflammatory bowel disease from the wrong food. Oh, fantastic. Um, is there any special foods or herbs that can assist with this? Most people will have heard of chamomile. This is a, a both a relaxant to the gut and it also has a slight bitter taste and that anything that's slightly bitter helps you produce more good digestive enzymes and good digestive juices. And it helps you produce more bile, which is necessary for the digestion as well. So ginger's a really good digestive, cardamom, fennel and peppermint. Um, those are really excellent also for building up the strength of your digestion and to have after food to help you digest that food more easily. Um, so they might stop bloating and wind and make the whole passage of digestion easier. And you can use these spices generally in your food as well. So the more you use digestive spices, cumin is another one, um, the stronger the, your digestion will become. That's great. Do you have any extra tips for our viewers on how to improve their digestive health? Yeah, sure. So firstly, sit down to eat. I think a lot of us uh, eat on the run, eat in the car, eat, eat standing up. Um, so sit down, chew your food really well and practice one meal a day where you're actually chewing until the food is a liquid in your mouth because you've got a lot in your saliva in your mouth that starts the digestion of food. Make sure you're generally well hydrated. Make sure that you don't lie down after eating. This weakens the digestion. So you're best to go for a walk for at least 10 minutes after a meal. Avoid eating late at night. So your digestion is strongest when the sun's highest in the sky. Um, so that's normally between 12 and two. The other thing is to only eat when you're hungry. So if you're eating and you're not hungry, it means you're still digesting the meal from before. That could be the night before. At the same time, don't let yourself get starving. You know, that can be detrimental to the body as well. We need to be um, nourished as well as have times of fasting just a healthy general plate of food would be half a plate of plant food with lots of green leafy vegetables in there. They stimulate the liver to produce more bile and help digestion. A quarter of a plate of carbohydrates, so within that would be starchy vegetables like um, sweet potato and pumpkin or whole grains like brown rice, quinoa, buckwheat. Uh, and then about a quarter of a plate of protein, whether that's animal protein, vegetarian protein or vegan protein. And within that, about 20% of good, healthy fats. They are very important for your nervous system. And fluid is best to have warm for your gut, so that uh, absorbs more. And you need to have enough for your height and weight. So if you times your weight by 33, so say if you're 60 kilograms and you times that by 33, you'll get the amount of mils, so it might be 2,000 mils, which is two litres, that you should have a day. And it's important to drink systematically. Thanks for such valuable information, You're Michelle. Well. If you'd like to know more about the importance of the nervous system on the digestive system's health and Michelle Wolf, please go to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. That's all for us from today. Bye-bye until next time. If you'd like to know more about our show, please like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel.